Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lee Ann Bryan from the National Center on Subsidy Innovation and Accountability, welcoming you all to this afternoon's webinar. This is going to be our last webinar of the current fiscal year related to program integrity. We're very pleased for the success that we've had thus far with this webinar series, and we're definitely looking forward to what we might be bringing to you all in fiscal year 2020. We'll get into that more at the end of the webinar. Um, but we have had some great participation these past four webinars, and we do hope that that momentum continues for today's webinar. So today we're talking all about what we're going to do or what states are doing after they've received the results of their fraud investigation. And if I can get my slides to move forward, that would be wonderful. There we go. All right, so just some quick call logistics before we actually get started. As always, we do hope for an interactive session. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll be hearing from two states in particular, Alaska and Utah. We'll stop throughout the webinar for open discussion, you know, an opportunity for questions, either of us as presenters or our panelists. But at any time, you can feel free to raise your hand. Um, you all are muted on our end. However, if you raise your hand, we can unmute you so that you have an opportunity to ask questions or participate in the discussion. Um, you can also enter any questions or comments into the questions panel on your GoToWebinar dashboard. And what else here? Oh, for the phone call option, if you called in using your phone, you do need to enter your audio PIN number in order to be heard. If you don't enter that audio PIN, then you are not able to unmute your line, which in turn, we will not be able to unmute you here either. So again, if you haven't done so already, please enter your PIN number. And if anyone should happen to have any issues with using GoToWebinar or getting any of the handouts, please feel free to email Katie Watts. Her email is shown on the screen, but just in case you're having issues seeing the webinar slides, it's kwatts, K-W-A-T-T-S, at WRMA.com. So here are our Subsidy Center presenters for this afternoon. Again, this is Leanne Bryan. I'm the Program Integrity Manager here at the Subsidy Center, or NIXIA. I've had a few different roles while at the Subsidy Center these past few years, including TA Liaison and Error Rate Specialist, but I think my heart has always been in program integrity and keeping, you know, my finger on the pulse of fraud prevention strategies and increasing program integrity. And I feel like I've always kind of go back to my state days and pull on my experience from there. And in the past few weeks, months, and even the past year, very fortunate enough to have our program integrity team here at NICSIA grow. So we have two program integrity subject matter experts here with us today, Janae Broadway and Mike McKenzie. Janae, prior to joining the Subsidy Center, was with Louisiana's Child Care Program. She was their fraud manager. And Mike McKenzie comes to us from Wisconsin's DHS Office of Inspector General, and he led up the Fraud Investigation Recovery and Enforcement section. So super pleased to have this team together here at the Subsidy Center and looking forward to looking forward to our webinar. And we'll hear from Mike and Janae a little bit more later. And actually, I'm going to turn it over to Shelly Dilks now from the Office of Child Care for a short welcome message. Shelly? Thanks, Leanne. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Shelley Dilks from the Office of Child Care in the Central Office in Washington, D.C. I want to uh, welcome you all to this webinar this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time to uh, get on the phone to, to listen to the exciting things that we've got planned for you this afternoon. Uh, like Leanne, um, I also uh, you know, get get excited about making making changes and uh, updates to to the programs, so that um, program integrity can be improved um, out in the out in the states and territories, uh, and and the tribes. And so we are very excited to 
to move into the next phase of, of what we've been talking about all year. And, um, and we have two states on the phone with us today. We've got Alaska and Utah on the phone, um, and they're going to be sharing some of their strategies. So I'll uh, give it over uh, to Leanne, and um, gl I, once again, I'm glad you're with us today. Thank you, Shelley. All right, so here's the agenda for our time together this afternoon. Real quick, we wanted to share an updated section of the Fraud Toolkit. That is the Detection Assessment Tool. We released that one about a month ago, and for those who have been participating in these webinars, I'm hearing a lot of background noise. Those people on the line, can you please Thank you. Whatever, whatever the hell was, it's all better now. Okay, so again, we have the detection section of the Fraud Toolkit that we wanted to share with you all just briefly before we get into the meat of the discussion, which is again, back to you have completed your fraud investigation or you know your team, your staff, your unit, now what? So we're going to talk through timely appeal and resolution processes, as well as preparing for that hearing. And then we're going to get into some recovery and sanction practices, practices that are used, you know, most frequently by the states, as well as some more, um, we'll say, unique strategies. And also, we'll hear from Janice Braden in Alaska and Jeremy Nolden in Utah. They're gonna share their specific state strategies as Shelly mentioned just a couple minutes ago. And as we mentioned earlier, we do hope for discussion throughout the webinar. We do not necessarily need to wait till the end for that. We're happy to answer questions and encourage discussion throughout. And then for next steps and closeout, we'll talk just real briefly about what we're planning for fiscal year 20, 2020. Seems to be quite a bit of delay on moving through the slides. Apologize for that. All right, so with the Fraud Toolkit, again, I see a lot of familiar names on our attendee list, so I'm hoping that this isn't new, at least for most of you. But our Fraud Toolkit is really a way to help our CCDF lead agencies with increasing their program integrity and decreasing fraud within their child care programs. So our first tool, an overall fraud risk assessment tool, was released in May of 2018. We've also released a prevention assessment tool, and now most recently a detection assessment tool. For those of you that may not be familiar with these tools, I'm going to do a quick demo just for a couple sections of detection. If I can pull it up here quickly. I'm hoping you all can now see my screen, which is showing the fraud detection assessment tool. So essentially, I need to hide some things, I apologize, from the GoToWebinar dashboard. Okay, so it starts with different categories of questions that are all related to fraud detection. And as you or your team are sitting down together looking through these different questions, you answer them, of course, to the best of your ability. So I did not yet select any responses related to fraud hotlines. So you would ask these questions of yourself, your team, does the lead agency have a fraud hotline or other method for individuals to report suspected program fraud, waste, or abuse? And we do know that pretty much all states out there do in fact have a fraud hotline. So then when we answer yes, the risk here for this specific question is low. And then we also see a recommendation. So here, terrific. A fraud hotline or other reporting mechanism is an essential component of a comprehensive program integrity strategy for combating fraud, waste, and abuse. So you would just continue responding to these questions. Does your fraud hotline have an automated response when it is not staffed? that 
allows callers to leave complaints and describe the type of information needed to open an investigation. I'm going to go ahead and say yes for this one. And again, some additional recommendations are provided there in the recommendation column. And then here our third question related to the fraud hotline, are complaints reviewed daily, logged for tracking, and routed to the appropriate division for investigation? For this one, I'm going to say no, we're not reviewing these daily. So the risk is now showing as medium. And then our recommendation, procedures for monitoring complaints through the fraud hotline ensures action is taken. And then procedures to assist with internal controls can include reviewing referrals daily and tracking staff actions. So again, as you can see, we have different categories. We have categories related to data usage in this tool. Scrolling down here, public websites provider audit, getting out into the field and reviewing those and blogs. I'm getting that background again. All right, it seems to have gone away. So fraud investigations then. And I mean I won't read through all of these. But I'll say, um, let's say for some of these, either no, or perhaps you're just not sure of a response. Maybe you need to follow up with someone back in the program office and get a little bit more information, have some more discussions. So I'll continue to respond to these questions just so I can show you the results summary. So now fast forward, I've responded to all of the questions within the tool. Down here in the results summary tab, we'll click on that one. And essentially what the tool does is provides a summary of your responses to those questions. So it assesses what your risk might be related to fraud, specific to what you might have in place related to detection strategies. So you can see here, based on the completion of the tool, my you know, Utopia program office is looking pretty good. There was only 14 low responses, five medium, and two high. And then you can also see in the category-based risk summary, it summarizes the responses for each of those categories. So it looks like for this you know, tool that I completed, I need to go back and take a closer look at fraud investigations, look at different strategies and see how we can improve in that specific area of detection. So we do encourage everyone that um, tool is in your handout and I also emailed the tool as well as all of our other handouts out to everyone who was registered as of about probably an hour ago. Um, so please feel free to take that tool back, take a look at it, complete it for us. Um, and if you have feedback, we would love to hear it. We're always trying to improve the resources that we develop for all of you. And in order for us to continue to provide you with useful tools, it's really helpful for us to get that feedback. Nope, and that is not the slide I wanted to go to. I do apologize. But I believe we wanted to just launch a quick poll, make sure everyone's still with us. And this is hopefully is a pretty easy one. We just would like to know, have you or a member of your staff utilized any section of the CCDF Fraud Toolkit? So whether that was the initial overall fraud risk assessment tool, the prevention tool, the detection tool, it has been out for a little bit. Actually, we don't have that one on here. My apologies. The overall fraud risk assessment tool, the fraud prevention tool, both the fraud risk and prevention tool, or no, maybe you just haven't had an opportunity to look at them yet.
All right, so it looks like I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Oh, we've had 57% vote. I'm going to give it just another few seconds. If you have not voted yet, please go ahead and do that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this one. And I'll share the results with all of you. So it looks like we've only, or 82% have not had an opportunity to use this tool yet. And there's lots of sad faces here in the room. So we would definitely appreciate if you have an opportunity to please use that tool, um, or any of the tools really, perhaps starting with the overall fraud risk assessment, and let us know how it works out for you. Please feel free to reach out and give us that feedback. If you have suggestions for you know, anything we might be missing with that tool or improvements for the future, we'd love to hear it. Anything else you all would like to add? All right. So I am going to go ahead now. Well, let me ask you this. For those that have used the tool, is there anything you'd like to share with us? Did you find it useful? Yes, you'll need to raise your hand and then we can unmute you. Don't be shy. If you could, if you have used the tool and you would just like to share a little bit about it, please go ahead and raise your hand. No hands raised. Everybody's quiet today. Okay. Oh, I don't have, I'm not, is it Junior Martin? I don't, oh, there he is. Junior, you can, you are unmuted. Are you able to share a little bit about that fraud toolkit? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes, thanks, Junior. Hey, uh, Junior Martin, State of Wisconsin, Program Integrity. Um, so we used a tool a few months ago. Um, it, I just wanted to share my experience. It might seem complex, but it's very simple, pretty straightforward. It's about 20, 30 questions, give or take. Um, but it does give you sort of an insight into your program, you know, as to whether you have good practices in place. So I would highly recommend using it. Um, one of the things we did as well, I had other staff um, complete it, so other supervisors within our program, just to see if they have a different perspective than mine. Um, so that was pretty telling as well, because you know we all think our program is perfect, um, but that's not always the case. So it's it's a really neat tool, um, and it will give you suggestions of how to improve. So um, I'd highly recommend you know checking it out. Thank you very much, Junior. And I like that idea about you know having other folks complete it and then comparing responses and see, you know, was it different? Was it the same? Now I'm sure you got some different responses there in the overall assessment. Yeah, overall we were on the same page there were a few um few of the items that we disagreed on um but it 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 helped to have some really constructive discussions about those items so perfect thank you so much anyone else like to share before we move on i'll just pause here for a couple seconds see if any other hands are raised All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mike McKenzie now, and he's going to present. Oh, these slides are not cooperating with me today. And get us started on timely appeal and resolution process. Okay, thank you, Leanne, and welcome everyone to our final program integrity webinar of the year. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope so. I want to talk to you today about CCDF requirements and some best practices that we've identified 
related to the appeal process and preparing for a hearing. So let's start with what the regs say. And on your screen, you can see 45 CFR section 98.45 related to state plan requirements tells you that the state, the lead agency shall demonstrate in, in your plan that it has an established payment practices applicable to all CCDF child care providers that include timely appeal and resolution processes for any payment inaccuracies and disputes. Now, while the regulations don't specify requirements for client appeals, we have found that many agencies follow similar processes that they have already established for provider appeals or even for other programs. We wanna show you some information we obtained from the Urban Institute related to the various methods that agencies use to accept appeals. We've listed the site where you can find this information yourself at the bottom of this slide. Keep in mind, this info was from fiscal year 2017, so these numbers may have changed. My guess is there probably are many more agencies that accept appeals online now. As you can see from the chart, the most prevalent method is still by mail, followed by in-person, fax, email, and online. Here are some common appeal processes we identified through working with our home states and looking at the CCDF policy database and the most current state plans that your agencies have submitted. As you can see, lead agencies have a variety of deadlines for accepting appeals, anywhere from 10 days to 90 days. Most agencies require a written appeal that includes the reason for the request. As more agencies offer this option online, they seem to include common reasons for appeals on the form, almost like a multiple choice. It's important to make sure your parents or provider know where to submit their appeal. In some cases, it depends on the action appeal. If it's related to eligibility, it may go to the worker assigned to the case. In some states, all appeal, appeals go directly to the state appeals agency, and they in turn will inform the CCDF agency. Now, before moving on to a discussion about preparing for a hearing, I wanna point out one best practice that more and more states are considering and that's the idea of reaching out to the parent or provider that appealed the action to try and resolve the issue prior to the hearing. We see this not only as a possible time and cost saver, because we know hearings cost money, but it's also good customer service. Remember that in any hearing, whether it's an IPV or an improper payment, the agency has the burden of proof. So we believe it makes sense to contact the petitioner prior to the hearing for several reasons. This approach gives you the chance to explain your reason for the action you took and for the petitioner to provide you any additional information that may result in the hearing being resolved before it happens. If you schedule a pre-hearing conference and they don't show up, you can share that information during the hearing. It lets the judge know that you made every attempt before the hearing to resolve this issue. Now let's talk about preparing for a hearing. We suggest you develop a format for a summary and evidence packet that you use for every hearing. Judges really like it when they know what they can expect and it can speed up the hearing. Provide the petitioner with a copy of the appeal packet prior to the hearing as well. Clear and convincing is the burden of proof expected in these hearings, 
and that means proof which results in a reasonable certainty of the truth of the fact that's in controversy. It is stronger than a preponderance of the evidence, and it's free from serious or substantial doubt. Even though an administrative hearing is not a formal hearing like a court hearing, be sure you practice courtroom etiquette and refer to the judge as your honor or judge and refer to the other parties by their last name. Remember to stick to the facts. Opinions and commentary are not needed and may only actually irritate the judge. Now, I just want to take a minute and summarize the different options you may have in terms of appeals. Some agencies have a formal, or as I described earlier, an informal first review of the appeal. This is generally that attempt to resolve the action being appealed prior to the hearing. Your agency is involved in the process and the outcome. In the case of an administrative hearing, the lead agency will be expected to present their case, and the administrative law judge or hearing officer will decide the outcome. In a court hearing, the agency will likely prepare the evidence packet, but your court counsel or a local district attorney will present the case and let the judge decide the outcome. Criminal court judges can also extend sanction periods or require monetary fines or reimbursement. Okay, now let's wrap up this section of the webinar regarding appeals and hearing prep with a brief group dialogue about how it works in your state. This is gonna be the first of two points in today's webinar that we'll set aside for a discussion. So my first question to you folks out there is, do any states still only conduct hearings in person? Raise your hand, please, if, uh, if that's the case in your state or your lead agency. No hands raised. And I'm honestly, I'm, yeah, one person? Yeah. Okay. Mike, maybe repeat the question for everyone. All right, I'm gonna repeat this question. Do any states only conduct hearings in person? And we got a couple hands raised. All right, so it looks like Alabama. Anybody Georgia. Wyoming. Hawaii. So we've got a few out there. We have a right? few out there, yep. It seems like more states have opted to use telephonic hearings for a variety of reasons these days. I uh, wonder if anybody wants to talk about why they conduct their hearings by telephone as opposed to in person and any pros or cons. Yeah. And again, give us a show of hands if you can, please. Those of you that conduct um, via telephone, as opposed to in person. If you could please raise your hand using your GoToWebinar dashboard. All right, looks like South Carolina, Wisconsin. Would anyone like to share why they've decided to solely go with Hearings by telephone. <laughs> Hearings by telephone. Thank you, Mike. Connie in South Carolina. Oh, Connie, you're muted. So we cannot unmute you on our end. Would anyone else like to share a little bit about their hearings? Their administrative hearings? Yeah, I'd say, folks, at this point, we'd be interested in any tips your agency uses 
to conduct hearings or to prep for those hearings. So if anybody's got anything you want to share with this group, love to hear from you, as long as we can unmute you. Okay. Diana from, oh, looks like you just put your hand down. If you would like to speak up again, go ahead and raise your hand, Diana. Oh, there she is. We got Diana unmuted. Yep, Diana Gillespie from West Virginia. You're on, Diane. Diana. Uh, we're not hearing from Diana. If you'd like, Diana, you can go ahead and enter what you were going to say into the Q&A box and we can read it out loud. In the meantime, let me just say it from my perspective, it seems as if telephonic hearings are definitely a money saver at this point with limited resources. And of course, these days they have the option uh, in some states at least to use Skype or another type of video conferencing if uh, if you prefer and your state will allow it. Um, we have another hand raised, um, Giselle Castillo from New York. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Giselle, if you want to um, share something with the group. Go ahead, Giselle. Giselle, if you're there, you can go ahead and talk. You are not muted on our end. Well, if you are trying to talk, we're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> so we apologize for that. Well, we do have some feedback that came in through the questions panel or the response panel. So Reggie Williams in Florida indicated that most hearings are done in person. Jackie Bentville in Delaware, Delaware does both. There may be instances where a person cannot make the hearing in person, therefore they will have it via phone. Wisconsin also does both. It depends on the judge as well as the location. Uh, in West Virginia, the sheer geographic makeup of the state makes telephonic communication more logical. Yep, that definitely sounds right, Diana. And Georgia has indicated that they conduct hearings in person and that they prep at least twice with the attorney prior to the hearing. And Leanne Hendricks, also in Georgia, says it's most helpful to be very familiar with your case. Couldn't agree more. All right, so it sounds like most of our sharing today is going to be done via the chat box, and that is definitely okay. Yeah. Um, we will keep an eye on that. So thank you very much for the feedback that you did provide. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the chance to talk with you about this today. Uh, remember that preparation really is the key to success with this. Now that's if there's one thing you take want to take away, that's what we'd like you to take away from this. With that, I'm going to hand the mic over to Janae Broadway, or as I like to call her, Broadway Janae. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Hi. So let's discuss the recovery of improper payments now, starting with what is required. In the Code of Federal Regulations, the Public Welfare, Welfare 98.68B2, the passage on your screen, we see that lead agencies should have a plan in process to recover fraudulent payments from the party responsible for committing fraud. Now, let's talk about, we'll talk about the word or the definition of fraud in a second, but let's first review some basics when discussing CCBF improper payments and recovery. All right, so we know that payments must be or should be recovered or can be recovered from providers and participants. As stated, fraudulent improper payments must be recovered. There are four types of improper payments. 
fraud or IPB if the definition is different, unintentional program violation, and administrative or agency error. Now, when reviewing the CCDF 1921 state plan, section 8.1.5A, we notice that the minimum threshold for recovery actions range from $1 or no minimum to $300. So let's now discuss uh, or look at some data surrounding the types of actions for recovery. All right. So from the data, from the 1921 CCDF state plans, again, the data, here we see state recover improper payments via collection agency, repayment plans, reducing future subsidy payments or recoupment, some call, sometimes called recoupment, tax intercepts, and other means such as court orders, wage garnishments, lien and levy actions, and estate recovery. You will notice here a common action for recovery regarding IPB, fraud, UPB, or at men era is the use of repayment agreements followed by the reduced payments for improper payment category. Now while, now, while not all improper payments result in sanctions, we do want to touch on the requirement of imposing sanctions. And um, on your screen, you'll see the same passage from the Code of Federal Regu Regulations 45-9860A but here we'll point out that the lead agency should have a process in their plan to impose sanctions on clients or providers in response to fraud. In reviewing state information regarding the process of imposing sanctions on individuals, it is important that the action, the sanction is followed by the establishment of fraud. Now, many states align their sanction periods with other programs. Common, san common sanction periods for participants include first violation, six months, second violation, 12 months, and third violation, maybe an individual or participant may be permanently disqualified. However, we also saw that sanction periods may range from 12 to 24 months and permanent sanctions as well for participants. On the other end, for providers, we noticed that in response to the fraud or IPV action, a sanction period could be imposed or from the, from the onset, a provider can be permanently disqualified. Now, understanding that there aren't any formal regulations, therefore, the lead agencies have flexibility in implementing this requirement. It's important that the administration, this part of the federal regulation, is uh, inputted into the policies and procedures. All right, so let's move back to the word fraud and IPV. What we'll do now is we'll take a poll. And the poll is in reference to how lead agencies are defining fraud or IPV. Now, while the final rule does not define the term fraud and leads such flexibility to lead agencies, fraud in this context typically involves the knowing and willingful misrepresentation of information to receive a benefit. Now, it is advised that lead agencies carefully consider what constitutes fraud, particularly in the case of individual families. Now, on your screen, you'll see a poll come up in just a second. And here the question is, has the lead agency defined fraud and or IPV in their policy? And we'll give you a moment to answer, choose one of the listed choices. Yep, so for this one, one of the things that we were thinking here was the Office of Child Care through the regulation does not define fraud. Therefore, we know, as Janae mentioned earlier, states have flexibility on how they define both fraud and intentional program violations. 
so we have gotten some feedback here and there over the past couple years and you know is fraud are fraud and IPV the same or are they not the same and really that's up to each individual state so we just thought we would again ask a poll try to get some feedback and hear how, what you all are doing in the states related to fraud and IPV so are you defining those two terms separately or IPV only is defined in your regulation, statute, policy, only fraud is defined. Maybe you don't define either of them within your policy, or you define, you define both of those terms the same. Fraud and IPV are one in the same in your program. That could very well be. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this one share the results with all of you. So 49% indicate that fraud and IPV are in fact defined as two separate terms. And then we have 25% that have the same definition for fraud and IPV. I wonder if that 25%, and I, I don't know who said yes, but if you would like to share with the group you know, if you happen to know the reason why you define those two terms the same. If you could raise your hand and you'd like to share a little bit about that, that would be wonderful. Quiet bunch. Or type in, you can type into the chat box, the questions panel. For those who don't, aren't comfortable speaking up, it's okay. No hands raised, no typing. I've been quiet bunch. The 49% that say fraud and IPV are defined separately. Would anyone like to share what their two different definitions are if they have them handy? Or why they chose them. Yeah. Yep, it looks like Sarah Jane. We have fraudulent behavior in our rule is fraud is a criminal determination from the court. Yep, I think that's pretty common. Would anyone else like to share? Oh, yep, Sarah. Sarah Jane also said to establish fraud requires elevating to the district attorney and only if $5,000 or more. And Kelly Hamill, thank you. She says fraud, misrepresentation, and it looks like that definition is an intentional deception, omission, or misrepresentation made by a person with knowledge that the deception, omission, or misrepresentation may result in unauthorized benefits to that person or another person. Or, I apologize, my screen isn't scrolling for me, or any aiding or abetting of the commission of such act. Kelly, you must have had a, a quick cut and paste there for that one. <laughs> Yeah, or she knows that definition by heart. That could be too. All right, 
So as we close out the recovery and sanctions process, I do have one other question I'd like to ask. And by a show of hands, I'd like we'd like to know how many states recover intentional program violations. So recover for recovery is done when a violation has occurred against the program rule regardless of if it's, if it's a participant or a provider. Recovery is done for an IPV. Show of hands. Looks like I'm seeing 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 25. All right, so it looks like the majority of the states on the phone do recoup or attempt to recoup for IPV. Would, like to share? Would anyone like to share successful strategies? In West Virginia, recovery is pursued for all overpayments. Thank you, Diana. All right. Thanks, everyone. So I think with that, we are going to go ahead and move to Utah and Alaska and hear their specific state strategies. Janine, are you going to introduce or do you want sure, to? Sure, I can. From Utah, we have Jeremy, Jeremy, Nolan, and he is the overpayments manager for the Department of Work for services in Utah. Jeremy, are you there? Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so, like they said, I'm Jeremy Nolden. I'm the overpayments manager for the state of Utah. Um, and we're just going to talk about some of our strategies um, that we go through and, and kind of the organizational structure that we have uh, in our state. And then Diane Hunter, who's our collections manager, will go through some of the collections uh, pieces as well. So the state of Utah, we have a unit that we refer to as IOC, which is our investigations over payments and collections. It's comprised of 18 investigators that go out and put together evidence uh, to substantiate uh, referrals as fraud or as overpayments. Um, once that's been established, it goes over to our overpayments team, which consists of 10 benefit accuracy analysts um, who then look at the overpayment timeframes, they look at the amounts of the overpayment, and they determine the classification of the overpayment, whether it be um, an IPV or an agency error or an unintentional violation. Um, of those 10, we do have one that the majority of her workload is tied to child care provider overpayments. Um, and then the other nine share the workload of all the other programs, including child care recipient overpayments. Um, once the benefit accuracy analyst has determined the overpayment, it then goes to one of our five adjudicators and they adjudicate those payments. Um, they go ahead and prepare information for hearings if necessary. Um, and they're double checking the benefit as well that the, the benefit accuracy analyst has done. We also have two program specialists who receive electronic um, databases that go over income and assets that have been reported and they look at cases to see if that reported information had ever been reported by the customer. I'm act on that. Uh, then we have one criminal specialist who puts together discovery packets and refers those to the Utah State Attorney General uh, for prosecution. Once we've determined overpayments and adjudicated those and passed appeal timeframes, they then go to our collections team, 
which consists of eight collection specialists, two legal secretaries, and one business analyst. And we can go to the next slide. So some of our tools that we use to determine calculations, um, we do have the referral hotline, um, which we have already talked about here in, um, in this webinar. We also have frontline staff that as they review cases and they come across something that's suspicious, uh, they can submit a referral to our uh, either our investigators to gather more evidence or if the evidence is already on the case, they can submit that referral to our benefit accuracy analyst to determine the calculation of the overpayment. Um, we also receive information from the Office of Child Care from time to time um, where they have information of an overpayment uh, tied to a provider. Um, and we also have state auditors that audit uh, child care providers as well. They go in and they uh, research sign-in, sign-out sheets and attendance records and look for discrepancies um, with the provider and what they're reporting to our agency. And if there's discrepancies, they will submit referrals to us as well uh, with the evidence that they've gathered. They kind of work like a, an additional investigator at that point, collecting the evidence. Um, we also utilize in our state some data mining elements um, where we're looking at electronic information that's coming in, such as where they filled out their application to see if they're in the state, um, and other elements that are electronically found. We also um, have incomplete claim closures. So if the investigation is submitted to, um, and we are requesting information from a provider or a recipient, and they do not follow through with that request, our investigators will close the case temporarily until they can receive that information, um, tries to promote the customer into actually providing that information. We also have our operations manual, which houses all our policies, our procedures, our pathways uh, to help out workers and the overpayments team. And we utilize our EREP system, which is our eligibility program, to find discrepancies as well. Um, if you have a case, for example, where the customer has uh, reported that someone is offering childcare to them um, and, or they, they are doing childcare, and the amount that we show in our system from a recipient uh, that's supposed to be paid to them is different, uh, we can pull that information and find those discrepancies as well. Next slide. Um, so we coordinate, we've already talked about the hotline, we coordinate with the hotline to receive referrals from the public. Uh, we talked about state auditor, um, and they're really just trying to clear up discrepancies um, that they're finding and um, we have, we've had a lot of success with the audits um, recently and getting some of those overpayments where uh, the provider has not had children in care for the hours um, that they've reported, and so we've been able to collect overpayments on that. We also have our, our, excuse me, our administrative hearing process where um, our adjudicators and other specialists are completing discovery packets. Um, all our hearings are done over the phone. Um, because we are a statewide agency, that makes it convenient for our customers so that they all have access, uh, more so than they would have if it was in person. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the cost, I think, is definitely a factor to that. And then we also work and coordinate with the state attorney general office. Uh, we actually have one of our um, workers on our collection team that works part-time as well at the attorney general office. Um, so she does both roles, and so there's a lot of coordination there. Um, and any recipient with an egregious intentional violation, uh, we would screen them for criminal uh, prosecution. Typically, we look at a standard of about $5,000 and it needing to be intentional. Um, sometimes we will uh, vary from that a little bit. Some of the benefits of the state prosecution is it comes with a 10% civil penalty. Um, and it also... Our current uh, prosecution, currently we have a case um, for $73,000 for child care for a recipient that is going through criminal. So that's just one of those things that we have going on now. Um, and I'm not aware of any current providers that are being prosecuted. Um, but we do work a lot with state attorney general to try to get those. We usually, um, statewide for all programs, um, we are submitting about four to five cases per month 
to our state attorney general. Um, like I said, that's all programs. It's not just child care, but it is uh, all inclusive. So, next slide. So as far as our timeliness and disqualifications, um, we send a customer a notice of agency action um, at the point where our benefit accuracy analyst is determined that an overpayment exists um, and they determine the classification. Um, it does allow for appeal within 30 days from the notice date um, and it does also allow for good cause if there's extenuating circumstances to increase that time frame if needed. Um, the customer's case is then adjudicated and once that appeal time frame is passed, an order is sent. Um, there's no statute on the orders um, or on the, there's no statutes on the overpayment. However, the order is good for eight years um, once that's been uh, sent. So we do disqualifications. Um, we follow the time frames of 12 months for the first um, one, 24 months for the second, and lifetime uh, for a third violation. Currently, as of, well, as of August of 2019, we have 42 current disqualifications, and those are for recipients, and we have five provider uh, disqualifications currently. So our providers and our recipients have the same appeal time frames. Uh, we don't differentiate between those. So that's kind of the process up to that point. Um, once it's been adjudicated, then it turns over to our collections department. And um, Diane is going to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Jeremy. Sorry, we had to trade places. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm going to assume so. I'll just keep going. So we have uh, split out uh, talking about the collections between recipients, and then the next slide will be for providers. Uh, just to let you know, for the state of Utah, we have the one collection team that does collect back all public assistance issued um, over the, we collect back all of the overpayments for the entire state. We collect back not just uh, child care recipient and child care provider, but also SNAP over payments, recipient medical and financial debts. And we do not contract out or give our debts to outside collection agencies. We keep those in-house. So from this slide, you can see for fiscal year 2018, for recipients, we had 517 new debts open and we collected just over $623,000. For fiscal year 2019, we had 433 recipient debts open and we collected back 819,000. Um, as when uh, fiscal year 2020 started, our liability is 1,718 debts for over $3 million. For recipient collection methods, we use direct pay or um, and, and we will do repayment agreements with those. We do take recoupments out of ongoing child care benefits. And with uh, recipient debts, we will take a judgment, which allows us to take a state tax refund offset. Um, and just for informational purposes, for all of our debts combined, 59% of all of our collections come from direct pay, which is really high. Um, I've talked to other states and, and they're kind of impressed with that number. Um, I attribute that to us just being willing to work with the um, recipients and, and try to work out a repayment plan that um, they can keep. Next slide, please. So uh, now we go on to child care provider. For fiscal year 18, we had um, <clears throat> 1,861 new debts with just over 2 million collected. Fiscal year 2019, we had 1,708 in new debts open and we collected uh, 1.5 million uh, at the start of this year. Fiscal year, we had 897 total debts 
for uh, one million dollars the liability. Uh, the only method that we have right now for provider collections is direct pay. So most of the providers, um, when they realize that they have received an incorrect benefit, they are returning that money to us even before a notice goes out. Um, we're working with our attorney now to possibly talk about taking judgments against businesses, but we haven't done that yet. So we're just kind of um, starting that process. I'll turn the time back over to Jeremy. And I'll just say any questions? So oh, Jeremy, this is Leanne from the Subsidy Center. It looks like Amelia Montoya in Texas had a question right at the start of your presentation, and it has to do with business drivers. And maybe others on the phone can type in their responses to this one as well. And I've heard this come up a few different times, actually quite recently, but how are folks documenting the income, especially if it's unreported income, of Uber or Lyft drivers? So we recently, I know we had a policy um, recently where we clarified how we look at that income offhand, I don't know, but I know they do self-employment ledgers, typically. Yeah. Yep. Or I was going to say 1099. Yeah. Would anyone else like to volunteer how they're documenting income, unearned income for folks in this, I just learned this term a couple weeks ago, gig economy for Lyft and Uber drivers, DoorDash, that's another one. Would anyone else like to share real quick related to verifying income for Uber or Lyft drivers? Yep, Kelly Hamill, I like to try to provide this date. Oh, Kelly, I don't recognize that web address. But Kelly Hamill, from whatever state you're from, 1099 and self-employment logs. Kelly, if you wouldn't mind just typing in real quick what state you're from, that would be great. In Florida, they treat that gig economy as self-employment. Oh, Kelly is from Florida. Thank you, Kelly. Sarah Jane has a follow-up question related to this Uber driving, and then we're gonna go ahead and move on, but we can certainly come back to this conversation later. But Sarah Jane is asking, for federal minimum wage, do states look at hours of childcare used for those Uber drivers? If you could please type your responses in or raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Looks like Sarah Jane Giraldi is from Colorado. Again, she's asking for federal minimum wage. Do states look at hours of childcare used for Uber drivers? As opposed to hours worked with no income because they do not meet minimum wage. If folks want to type responses into that one, that would be great um, for Sarah Jane in Colorado. Any other questions for Jeremy and Diana, specific to Utah strategies for recoupment and collection sanctions? Oh, it looks like for Jeremy and Diana, Giselle has a question. Can you please elaborate on the state tax agenda item? Uh, do you mean taking state tax refund offsets? Does this 
Adele, we're going to go ahead and unmute you so you can feel free to ask your question directly of Diana and Jeremy. Actually, Giselle typed in yes. So, um, on recipients, when if if the debt is not if they can't pay it off right away, we will allow them to make monthly payments, but we also secure the debt with taking a judgment. So due to that judgment, we are able to offset a state tax refund. So it's like treasury offset, if anybody knows what that's <laughs> about for SNAP debts. Um, but instead of taking federal money, we can take state money. So if they're getting a refund for state taxes, we will get that instead of having it go directly to the recipient. So it pays down their debt. I hope I answered your question. Giselle, you are unmuted if you have any follow-up questions. Diana, that made sense to us here in the room. We were all nodding our heads in agreement as you were talking. Oh, very good. <laughs> all right, well, I haven't seen any other questions come in. So at this time, I think we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Janice Braden. Janice is joining us from Alaska's Child Care Assistance Program. And before I turn it over to Janice, I just want to note quickly that we did ask Utah, and they did a fine job sharing their strategies specific to overpayment, um, recovery, and sanctions, as well as um, hearings. But what we ask Janice in Alaska to do is to kind of put it all together in one package. So starting with fraud detection, investigation, walking through appeals hearings, as well as recovery and sanctions. So for Janice, again, we did ask her to kind of walk through the entire process. Again, just to kind of paint that bigger picture and tie it all together in one sort of case study or one walkthrough from start to finish. So Janice, are you there? Uh-oh. Janice, we're, we're not hearing We're not hearing oh. you. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we hear you now, thank you. Okay, I, I just wanna do a time check as well. Um, I'm, I believe we're over, so do you want me to do the abbreviated no, version? No, no, we still have 20 more minutes. Oh, okay. Then I had it on my calendar incorrectly. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I am Janice Braden. I am with the State of Alaska Child Care Program Office, and I oversee the Child Care Assistance Program. If you'll go to the next slide. Um, our child care assistance program is administered by three regional nonprofit agencies for five different service delivery areas throughout the state um, through a grant process. The Division of Public Assistance Child Care Program Office oversees and monitors grant compliance as well as um, child care assistance program compliance. So the Child Care Program Office writes program regulations and policies and procedures and monitors those grantees for compliance with administering the program. Our grantees only have access to our integrated child care information system for processing uh, child care assistance cases. Next slide, please. So for the fraud detection and referral, there are many different ways in which fraud can be detected. It is through um, our grantees um, when they are doing interviews or reviewing information uh, from one renewal period to the next. It's with our Division of Public Assistance Quality Assessment when they do uh, file reviews for our federal error reports. Um, our DPA contracted services quality assurance 
when they do file reviews for um, our program compliance of our grantees, our fraud unit gets, gets information from all of our Division of Public Assistance programs. And anytime they get information, they tie as many programs as they can to it. So oftentimes we're pulled in, child care is pulled into um, another type of benefit um, potential fraud investigation. Parents will report on other parents um, if they're going through difficult custody situations or they're just mad at each other, they'll um, report that to either the grantee or to the state. And then we even get anonymous reports from a neighbor who happens to see people home all the time and they know that they're on the program or whatever that situation could be. All uh, suspected fraud cases are referred to the Child Care Program Office for further review. Um, we did implement in 2017 a process for grantees um, at the time of application. If while they're looking at that uh, recipient's application or during, during the interview, information is not comparing from one review period to the next or even during the interview, they're conflicting with what they've put on the application. Um, you know, we ask the grantees to ask more information, try and get it clarified right now instead of down the road. And if the information is still conflicting, they can send um, a form to our office, the Child Care Program Office, asking for additional information. We can then do some um, further research to try and either support what that family is saying or provide supporting documentation that is not what the family is saying. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. So our office um, has additional databases that we can review. We look at our eligibility information system, which is used for um, Alaska Temporary Assistance, Adult Public Assistance, SNAP, Medicaid. We look at child support. We access Department of Labor, um, Department of Motor Vehicles, our Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend Database, sometimes Vital Statistics, Engines, and um, also social media to try and help either support what that family is saying or provide documentation that disclaims what the parent is saying. Um, our office then m makes a determination if we believe that, w you know, well, first, if information was given to another um, Division of Public Assistance Agency for a different program, we take that information as being received by our program, even though it, it wasn't. Um, and we will forward that on to the grantee saying, no, we've got the information, go ahead and use this. Um, we look at all of these different sources and make a determination, was this questionable information, is it a mistake um, or is it an intentional act to withhold or to misrepresent? We will refer anything that we view as intentional to our fraud unit and we then get guidance from them as to whether or not they want us to request additional information from that family or hold tight. Um, sometimes if additional information is asked for, it will set a different path than if we just hold and, and let the fraud investigators do their investigation. If we do ask for additional information and it's, and it's received, we'll work it as usual. Um, if it's not received, we may end their participation depending on what it is that we're asking for either verification or clarification on. 
Next slide. Our fraud unit will um, conduct an investigation and that includes accessing additional databases to include bank records. They, they will do surveillance depending on what the situation is. They interview any person who may have knowledge of the allegations and then they will interview the participating parent. Um, next slide. So they gather up all of their, their evidence. They will contact that participating parent. They will issue, uh, it's a very long name, um, a child care assistance program recipient notice of suspected intentional program violation and your option to waive an administrative disqualification hearing notice, um, which does, it lays out for that participating parent the allegations, including a recalculation of the benefits and the amount overpaid, um, their rights. Um, it advises them of penalties that would be imposed if, even if they don't admit to the facts as stated in that notice. Um, it clarifies that they can be prosecuted either by the state or federal government in a court of law. Their appeal to those allegations is to request an administrative disqualification hearing. If they do not, if they waive their right to that administrative disqualification hearing and um, agree to repayment of the overpayment without admitting to any of the fraudulent act, um, they no longer have an administrative appeal any appeal after that would have to be through a court of law. So if they, they, they have the option during this notice period to either say, um, basically, I'm not agreeing with, what you, with the evidence that you've presented me, but I'm gonna go ahead and sign this document. I'll repay the overpayment and, and take my intentional program violation, whether it be the first, second, or third, and be on my way, or they can go through the disqualification hearing process. Either way, they would, if they go through the disqualification hearing process and they are adjudicated as having committed an intentional program violation, they are required to repay any benefit overpayment that they've received. Um, next slide, please. So our intentional program violation penalties um, are a little bit different for families versus providers. So for our family, the first one that results in no dollar loss the penalty is a provider lock-in for six months, where we say you can only use this provider type, um, meaning a licensed provider. Although we may have some situations where if a family is working um, irregular hours, they may have to use a different provider type. Um, we do have that flexibility to, to lock them into a type. The first intentional program violation with a dollar loss um, requires repayment of the program loss, provider type lock-in for six months, and a 10% reduction of program benefits for six months. The second one, um, regardless of the dollar loss, requires repayment of the program loss, provider lock-in for 12 months, and a 20% reduction of program benefits for that 12 months. And then a third, intentional program violation, regardless of the dollar loss, requires repayment of the program loss and permanent termination from program participation. With our providers, the intentional program violation must result in a dollar loss of at least $100 or more. The first one requires repayment of the program loss and then compliance with the corrective action plan and as well as more frequent review and on-site visits. The second one requires repayment of the program loss 
suspension from program participation for six months, as well as more frequent review and on-site um, visits. And then the third intentional program violation requires repayment of the program loss and permanent disqualification from program participation. Um, so next slide. So taking you through a case review, um, we had a, uh, a family that applied in March of 2012 as two parents with one child. They continued to participate and renew participation. Um, and then in January during their re renewal, it was now a one parent family with two children, indicating that um, the the applying parent indicated that they were married but separated and working on a custody arrangement. Um, later in 2015, a third child was born of the same parents. This one parent and now three children continued to participate and renew. And in 2017, their renewal application still had them as a one parent family with three children, no custody arrangement, um, still separated, the participating parent changed from working for an employer to becoming self-employed. Um, and there was a fourth child born of the two parents. So this referral came from our grantee um, to the child care program office um, as they were trying to verify the applying parent income for self-employment through the um, business's website, um, they noticed on the website that it said it was under new ownership and had the husband and wife as the new owners. So that in addition to the fourth child being born of the same parents when the parents have no contact with each other, um, caused the grantee to suspect that that spouse was not um, listed as part of the family and they really were living in the home. Um, so our office um, reviewed the state of Alaska business license, DMV records, which showed um, two vehicles registered to both parents at the same address. It also showed another vehicle with just the husband. Um, their permanent fund dividend records showed consistent applications um, at the same address. And social media showed them as owners of this business, as well as photos of a family vacation they had taken together recently. So the Child Care Program Office um, determined that um, this was an intentional act and made the referral to our fraud unit. Um, the fraud unit um, began their investigation, determined that um, they were in fact married, that um, they had shared bank records, they have um, you know, the, the same shared motor vehicles. Um, they also in Department of Labor records um, identified that the applying parent had underrepresented, underreported her actual self-employment income. Um, they interviewed the husband who admitted that he was in the home the whole time. So they printed the, presented the allegations to the applying parent, which were six applications for failing to declare the husband in the home, as well as his income, 14 self-employment income deduction worksheets that were intentionally underdeclared for income, and a loss statement. Um, in this case, the loss was $53,627 just from 2015 through August of 2017, um, and that it was being referred to um, the court for criminal charges. So, this parent um, signed a waiver of the administrative disqualification hearing form admitting to the first intentional program violation, understood that it was still going to be um, pursued by the state in, in court. Um, the court um, 
the court proceedings she entered into a plea of guilty to one consolidated count of unsworn falsification in the second degree, um, and that if she abides by the conditions of a deferred sentencing agreement, that she would be able to withdraw her plea at a later date. Um, this plea agreement also required the parent to make full restitution, which she did in a cashier's check. Um, as well as pay $1,000 to assist in offsetting the cost of the investigation. The fraud unit sent the Child Care Program Office all of those dispositions, findings, court orders, and our office then issued the Family Notice of Intentional Program Violation Penalties Notice, um, outlining the decisions, what the penalty was, and for how long. Um, so this family um, was assessed the first program, intentional program violation, the with a dollar loss. So the um, actual penalty was 10% reduction of benefits for six months and a provider type lock-in for six months in addition to the repayment. Um, that time frame ran from October 1st of 2018 through March 31st of 2019. This family was not actually participating during that time frame. They did uh, reapply with both parents on the application and were determined to be over income. Um, however, our penalty time frame runs from the time issued through the court or the administrative disqualification hearing for that continuous period, um, whether that family is participating or not. Um, so in this case, no additional penalty was actually imposed, but the recoupment of the, um, the benefit received fraudulently was recovered. Are there any questions that I can possibly answer for you? Thank you, Janice. That was an excellent case study, and I don't envy the staff person who had to process the overpayment on that self-employment income. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I remember those days. Self-employment is not easy. Any questions for Janice? Again, you can either type something into the questions panel or raise your hand. Real quick, Janice, can you share approximately how many um, children your child care program serves each year? Um, I believe we're right around 4,000. So we're, you know, a large state, but we don't have, you know, a really large population that we serve. All right, I see the time is very fast approaching 4.30. It's 4.29. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. I appreciate everyone's participation today. You've helped to reinforce with me as we move into the next fiscal year uh, that we would like to use Adobe Connect as our webinar platform. It definitely seems like folks are much more comfortable typing their comments, questions into a chat box as, to, as opposed to, you know, I'm muting and talking, which is completely fine. However, Adobe Connect is a much better platform for those types of discussions that are occurring, you know, via a type chat box. So as we think about FY 2020 and that program integrity webinar series, please, please, please send us your feedback. What would you like us to dig a little deeper into or share more strategies about, especially those who have participated in previous webinars? You know, I think data mining, data sharing, that one comes up a lot. Um, more on fraud investigation, um, more related to hearings and appeals. Whatever you guys are interested in, we are happy to deliver. Just need to get that feedback. So on the, um, the close of the webinar, there will be an evaluation that pops up. We definitely appreciate your feedback and want to hear from you, especially, you know, if there's 
things that you would benefit from hearing, learning more about, either from us or from your peers in future webinars. Um, also, the evaluation is an opportunity if your question did not get answered today or maybe something comes to light as soon as we hang up. You can definitely ask questions for our presenters for Alaska and Utah, and we can be sure to get those questions to them um, following the webinar. Again, just type them into that evaluation um, as part of the feedback, and we'll be sure to get your questions answered. And unless there's anything from anyone else here? No, thank you. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks again for participating today, and we look forward to hearing from you at the end of the year, probably in December, maybe our next webinar. But stay tuned. Thank you.